Hi, welcome to R&S Academy. My name is Ram Prasad. Let me give a small brief about me. I did my master's in r and and then I worked for 25 years with various organizations involving in product development and technology innovation functions. I had five patents filed on my name. Out of my passion, I transitioned into teaching. Presently, I am into coaching GATE and IES aspirants on r and subject. I also conduct workshop on r and systems, faculty development programs, etc. for the engineering colleges. Recently, I conducted webinars for the members of ISHRE and ASHRE. Based on the response I received for the lectures on refrigeration systems, I am presenting here with a series of lectures on psychrometry, again for the benefit of the students and the professionals. I believe these lectures will also add a great value to all of you. This is the fifth lecture in this series of lectures on psychrometry. In this lecture, I will discuss the part 2 of the applied psychrometry. Let me start with the sensible heat factor. It is the ratio of sensible heat to the total heat and it is expressed as SHF is equal to QS divided by Q which further can be expanded like this. From this expression, we can say that whenever the sensible heat load is more than the latent heat load, then SHF will be close to 1. And whenever the latent heat load is more than the sensible heat load, then the SHF will be close to 0. The SHF expression can be rewritten like this. By putting in the expressions related to QL and QS, the SHF can be expressed like this, which further will be resolved into this. What do these terms delta W and delta T represent? Let us understand it using the psychrometric chart and let us consider process AC. If we draw a horizontal line from A and drop a vertical line from C, then they will intersect at B. We will get delta T and delta W from here. During the process AC, the magnitude of change in temperature is represented by delta T and the magnitude of change in specific humidity is represented by delta W. These two are reflecting in the sensible heat factor expression and hence the process line AC is called the SHF line. By rearranging the SHF expression, we will get this expression. This is one of the very useful and important expressions in psychrometric calculations. The next is the apparatus dew point. We saw that the dehumidification must be accompanied by either cooling or heating process and dehumidification with cooling can happen when air is passing through a coil which is at a temperature less than the dew point temperature of the entering air. Interestingly, this is a highly diplomatic statement in the sense there is nothing wrong with this statement technically but we cannot conclude anything from this statement. Let me explain what I mean here. In any dehumidification process, we should precisely know the cooling coil temperature to achieve the dehumidification optimally. If we are keeping the coil temperature above this value, then we will not get the required dehumidification. On the other hand, if we are keeping the coil temperature below the required value, then we will get the required dehumidification, but both the initial cost and the running cost of the system will be higher. These two situations will never be acceptable to an engineer. Hence, we must precisely find the coil temperature to achieve the required dehumidification. Let me explain this process. Let 1 be the state of the air at 
coil entry and T1, W1 and H1 be the properties corresponding to state point 1. Let us now draw the SHF line starting from 1 until it intersects the saturation curve. The point at which the SHF line intersects the saturation curve is called the apparatus dew point of the coil or simply coil ADP. Therefore, for the given SHF and entry air state, the coil ADPC is the state at which the coil surface must be maintained in order to achieve the required dehumidification optimally. During this process, the state of the exit air lies on the line joining 1 to C. For a zero bypass factor, the state of the air exiting the coil will be at C, that is coil ADP. As the bypass factor increases from 0 towards 1, then the exit air state will be moving towards state point 1. For the bypass factor of x, the state of the air exiting the coil will be a 2 with its properties being T2, W2 and H2. Having discussed the importance of ADP, let me now explain the process of finding the ADP. We will consider a problem situation wherein we are given the SHF and the state of the air entering the cooling coil at state point 1. We need to find the ADP for this. Let us have the state point 1 plotted on the psychrometric chart and we can read the other properties from the chart. We have the expression for SHF like this and it can be rearranged like this. We know T1, W1 and SHF in this expression. Using the above expression and the psychrometric chart, we can find the ADP on trial and error basis or using iterative method. Assume a temperature T and collect the corresponding W value from the chart. Then substitute the T and W values in this expression against the TADP and WADP values respectively. Check whether the LHS and RHS values are equal. If not, change the T value accordingly, collect the corresponding W value from the chart and repeat the process. Whenever the LHS value becomes equal to the RHS value, that temperature is the TADP, that is apparatus dew point temperature. The point C is the coil ADP and this is the sensible heat factor line, SHF line. A small hint here, ADP will always be less than the dew point temperature of the air at the coil entry. The next is the heat load calculations. Let me start with a question. Why do we need to perform the heat load calculations? Or what is the purpose of this activity? Let me give a different flavor here. Let us say we have a room with a door and windows. Some people are there in the room, hence the light is on. Let us say they are watching TV. Now, I install a window AC in this room. I close the door and windows. No one from the room is allowed to go out and nobody from outside is allowed to enter into this room. Under this hypothetical condition, I am switching on the AC. Slowly, the temperatures of the room goes down and the, when the room temperature reaches 24 degrees centigrade, I will switch off the AC. We all know that the temperature of the room will start increasing. But why? We had the room, the door of the room and the windows closed. Nobody is allowed to enter into the room. In spite of this, why should the room temperature increase? It is because the room continuously gains both heat and moisture from various sources. What are those sources? Let us look at them. 
The first source is heat gained through walls and glasses by conduction. This is the heat that flows from outside into the room through the walls and glasses due to temperature difference. This heat transfer happens by conduction. Only energy transfer happens here. Hence, the room gains only sensible heat. This is the expression that is used to compute the heat gained by the room through this source. And Q is equal to Ua delta T gives us the heat gain through walls and glasses in kilowatts. Here U is the overall heat transfer coefficient 1 by Hi plus T by K plus 1 by H0. Hi, K and H0 can be had from the data tables. T is the thickness of the wall or thickness of the glass. The next A is the area of the wall which is obtained through the field survey. Delta T equivalent temperature difference to be taken from the data tables. The next source is heat gained through glasses due to radiation. This is the heat that flows from outside into the room through the glasses. This heat transfer happens by radiation. Only energy, energy transfer happens in this case also. Hence, room gains only sensible heat. This is computed using this expression. Q is equal to area into solar heat gain per unit area. The solar heat gain per unit area can be had from the data tables. The third source is infiltration load. Outside air flows into the conditioned space through the gaps and crevices around the windows and doors. The room gains both sensible heat and latent heat due to infiltrated air. First, the comp first we need to compute the infiltrated air into the room and then translate the same into latent heat and sensible heat. The next is the lighting load. Lighting load is computed based on the type of lights and the number of lights. Lights add only sensible heat to the room and it depends on the type of light. For example, a 100 watt incandescent lamp adds 100 watts of heat to the room. A 40 watt tube light adds 50 watts of heat to the room. And a 50 watt LED lamp adds just 5 watts of heat to the room. This is the reason why the commercial complexes are using LED lamps predominantly these days. The next one is occupancy load. Heat is released from the human beings due to body metabolism. The room gains both sensible heat as well as latent heat from the occupants. The occupancy load is computed using data tables based on gender, age, activity, number of occupants, etc. And final, the sixth load is the equipment load. Equipment like TV, computer, printers, etc. will be releasing heat into the room. The room typically gains sensible heat from the equipment. If we are using the equipment like coffee maker etc. then the room uh, gains latent heat also. Let us sum up the heat gains from these six sources and let that be x kilowatts. Of all the heat gains from these six sources, the sum of sensible heats gained is called room sensible heat. And the sum of the latent heats gained is called room latent heat. Finally, the sum of the RSH and RLH is called room total heat. Therefore, RTH is equal to x kilowatts. Let us now pull the original question back. Why do we need to perform the heat load calculations? The heat load calculations gives us the value for x which is nothing but the RTH. And what is the significance of RTH? RTH is the minimum cooling capacity expected from the air conditioner without ventilation feature. Hence, the criteria to select 
an air conditioner for a room either window unit or split unit is that it must have a minimum cooling capacity of RTH for that room. Please note that the window unit and split unit do not have the feature of accommodating ventilation for the room. Some window AC units have an option to allow outside air into the room by opening a small flap. But the user has to adjust with the higher room temperature than the set value. The supply of ventilation air is an extra load and we must have the air conditioning system accommodating this additional load by design. Whenever we are taking the outside air or ambient air for ventilation purposes, then it will add sensible heat load OASH and latent heat load OALH to the AC system. These two can be computed like this. OASH is equal to 0 0.0204 multiplied by CMMO temperature of the dry bulb temperature of the ambient air minus dry bulb temperature of the room. And this expression gives us the OASH in kilowatts. What is CMMO? It is the ventilation air required for that specific application. And it can be had from the data table specific to that application. Similarly, OALH can be computed using this formula. 50 multiplied by CMMO multiplied by specific humidity of the ambient air minus specific humidity of the room air. After computing OASH and OLH, OALH, we will get the total sensible heat load equal to RSH plus OASH. Similarly, the total latent heat load TLH is equal to RLH plus OALH. And finally, we have the grand total heat which is equal to TSH plus TLH. What is the significance of GTH? GTH is the total heat that must be removed from the moisture by the air conditioning system with ventilation feature. Typically, GTH is the minimum cooling capacity required for the central AC system. With this, this lecture is completed. In case you have any questions, doubts, etc., please feel free to write to me. The next topic is summer air conditioning with 100% recirculation. See you then. Thank you very much.